Please welcome to the stage, Ash Director of Conference and Events, Cindy Brewster. Good morning. Thank you, Freddie, for the extra emphasis on my name. We've been working together and practicing that, so <laughs> it's the perks, right? Greetings and good morning. It is my honor to serve in the capacity as your ASH Conference Director. <laughs> for many of you, this may be your first time attending an in-person conference in a very long time. Mine too. Thank you for your feedback, grace, and trust in this association to host you during your time in San Juan and virtually all over the world. Since June 2021, I've had the privilege of emailing many of you a lot, <clears throat> perhaps too much, being so excited to meet you in person here, planning and creating alongside my fellow ASH staff members and having far too much fun with the conference leadership team once a month. It is now my pleasure to introduce one of the conference leadership team comedians and co-chair of the 2021 Local and Community Engagement Committee, Awilda Rodriguez, who will engage in rich conversation with today's keynote speaker, Julio Ricardo Varela. Please give a warm welcome to Awilda. Thank you for um, joining us this morning. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Sandy. I've had a lot of fun on our conference calls, too. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I have the honor of introducing our keynote um, speaker today, Julio Julito uh, Ricardo Varela, um, who is currently editorial director for Futuro Media and is responsible for the overall editorial vision and vision of Latino USA, um, Latino Rebels, and the podcast In the Thick. A 1990 Harvard graduate in Latin American history and literature, Julio is a nationally recognized commentator on U.S. Latino issues and Latin America. In 2011, Julio founded Latino Rebels, one of the top U.S. Latino digital media sites in the world. Uh, he was recently named an MSNBC columnist this past October. Now, Julio is prolific. His bylines include NBC News, New York Times, Washington Post, among many others. He's appeared on outlets such as MSNBC, CBS News, ABC News, Democracy Now!, and Al Jazeera. Uh, Julio was born in Puerto Rico and moved to the Bronx when he was seven years old. It is my honor to welcome to the stage Julio Ricardo Varela. All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Do you want to try opening this water? I guess we yeah. had water problems before. <laughs> we oh, wait, these opened. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you um, and just hear your perspective on so many of these topics. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in last, uh, yesterday's session was that being Puerto Rican in some ways makes you feel like you're invisible in many ways. And yeah. so I think this is a great opportunity for us. To and exhausting. A, and exhausting. It's like triple consciousness. <laughs> um, and so I, I was really excited to have this conversation with you, to, you know, and among the ASH community mm -hmm. to really talk about um, Puerto Rico, its higher education system, and um, you know, a number of different topics. Um, and so I'm gonna start off with uh, you know, a really kind of softball question. And okay. then we could get a little harder from there. It's like um, Barbara Walters, yeah. you're being, you're like, set me up like Barbara Walters, okay. <laughs> Well, we, I, was, I was asking Cindy earlier, I'm like, am I doing this like John Stewart or am I doing this like Jesus and Mero? I wasn't sure. Oh, I, I'll go with Jesus and Mero. Okay, cool. Let's go with that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're a community of researchers, funders, practitioners in higher ed. And, you know, we all have our opinions about what is the most pressing higher education issue. It's usually what, we, what we're doing research on, what we're funding. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to get your perspective on this as a journalist who has a much wider lens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from where you sit, what do you see as one of the most pressing higher education issues in the U.S.? Oh, in the U.S.? We'll start there. Um, I, you know, that's a good question. 
So yeah, she didn't prepare me with these questions. So this is why I said, don't, don't tell me the questions because then you're going to get a natural reaction. And you, well, are you sure this is not a hard book? No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, in the end, I think the biggest problem right now is we're not honest with our history. And, you know, recent events already, you know, if you're following, you know, I'm a political geek and you just follow what just happened in Virginia. We've allowed ourselves as a country because of media to create absolute lies that have become reality. So if you say a lie so many times and then you have enablers. So it really gets me you know, as, as a dad, you know, I have two kids in college right now. Um, I have a senior at GW and a, um, who's crushing it and should be president of the United States. But, you know, every, every parent says that. And I have a, a, a first year at Suffolk University who's playing soccer. And I get to see him in Boston. And, I, and, and we tend to forget that institutions of higher education are actual sanctuaries. And what's happened in the last couple of years is that that trust that has sort of been violated. And now this community is seen as, quote unquote, un-American. When I would challenge the fact that the most American thing you can do is, is tell the truth and question things like white supremacy and colonialism, which, you know, welcome to the island colony. I, I call Puerto Rico the island colony. You know, because that's what it is. You know, it's not a territory. It's not part of the United States. Legally, it's not. It's owned by the United States. Legally. Look at the Supreme Court ruling. So we don't use those. So the problem is we use those words, and it's too easy now to attack those words. And there's enough history in this country to prove that this country was built on white supremacy. And so if we, if we don't have that conversation in academic circles, and then if we have people who literally are attacking both verbally and physically educators, I worry about that. I think it's a threat to democracy. I think we look at past places that, that went after educators and what has happened. So it really freaks me out. See, I'm, I'm trying not to curse before 10 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. And, and I think it's, I, and I, I just feel like there's so many good people to educate young minds, you all out here and so many others, that um, we as journalists, like one of the things in my, my profession that I'm just absolutely really frustrated about is this enabling of, of the other side. When I always say like, what's the other side to racism? <laughs> it's racism. You know what I mean? It's like, can we go there? No, but you get, you know, you get, it just happened. I just take this one thing. Like, it's all about wokeness now. You know, Virginia, the Democrats lost Virginia. And now it's because about wokeness. And I'm like, is it? Because have you talked to these generation of kids who actually are becoming more aware of history, who are becoming more aware of climate change, who are seeing, you know, the generational problems? And if you take it to Puerto Rico, you know, there's, I was just with friends, young friends of mine yesterday. It's like, there's such a feeling of disgust of what has happened in this country, in this island colony, that I don't even think the political structure, the political class of this island colony knows what's coming. That's a big thing. I mean, I literally went in. You know, I'm like Maria, you know, I work with Mariana Hosa. She's my co-host. She founded Futuro Media. She's like the, la mera mera. And we talk to people. Like I literally got into my taxi yesterday and I said, ¿Cómo está Puerto Rico? How's Puerto Rico doing? Guy says to me, mismo circo y payaso diferente. It's the same circus, different clowns. And it really, really gets me as a Puerto Rican in the sense of why? Why are we accepting this? Why have we let this sort of colonial party system dominate everything? And now, because we live in a, you know, austerity, which austerity is such a, it's a code word for like, we're getting rid of shit. 
that you you should have. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's like saying so it's like austerity measures. It's like it's not good. Like perfect example, the University of Puerto Rico college system was the pearl not only of the Caribbean, of Latin America for decades. I mean, this is one of the top, most prestigious educational, higher educational systems in the world, providing affordable education. Like, you know, that my family, La Yupi, like that is where, like I had uncles teach there. My dad, you know, it's like, the, it is part of the fabric. And to see it being attacked by a board, a fiscal control board, that is not even Puerto Rican. I mean, this is, you know, there were sugar barons that took over Puerto Rico in, you know, that took over the economy. These are the new sugar barons. And we're just letting it happen. Because you're not, because I, and, and I, you know, I ask that question and I then get labeled as a rabble rouser, a saboteur, a radical, a revolutionary, you know, like I'm leftist and I'm funded by the Venezuelan government. I've been here. I come back here. Everyone thinks I'm like funded by like Nicolas Maduro. I've had commentators say that on the radio. And I'm saying to myself, you're allowing this. You are, you are like hurting this generation of young Puerto Ricans who have had it, who grew up at a time where they have not had any opportunities. Okay. Like when, once the, I'm going all over the place. You tell me when, when you go, you know, I'm we, like, we'll unpack all of how this. did this go with the, uh, where did, it was one question, but let me just leave you with this last point before we go. This generation of young Puerto Ricans have never seen opportunity. If you think about it, 1996, when the 930s, and we can talk about it, the tax exemptions break and that's complicated. And then 10 years later, the Puerto Rican economy just, collapses. Okay. If you're a five-year-old kid in 2006, what are you now? 21? Like you have seen just devastation, both economically, socially, with the hurricanes, with the earthquakes, with just the political system and the two-party colonial system. You're living in a colony. It's, and the easiest way to get out is a jet blue flight you know, 50 bucks to, to Orlando and you're, you're done. And so we're not doing enough as a society to realize that we're, we're allowing this to happen in front of us. And then anyone who brings it up is already tainted as, well, you know, your Cuba's coming. Like that's basically what people in Puerto Rico think that if you cancel this debt, there'll be now Cuba, will, you know, the next Cuba will be in Puerto Rico which I find to be absolutely ridiculous. So anyway, sorry. So can you unpack that last sentence? You said Cuba is coming. For those that might... Yeah, yeah, no. I, so here's the thing about Puerto Rico. For people that try to understand, you know, Puerto Rico, like I said, is a colony of the United States. Let's call it for what it is. And I do appreciate you all coming down here because we're hurting. And so anything like this, when I see a full room and people working and I see my... You know, I get my mic set up, Daniel y todo, y they're getting money, you know, they're trying to, they're making it happen. And yes, we have to depend on that. So I want to thank Ash for, for being down here because it, it sends a really good message, right? And you know, that Puerto Rico is a place that you can be in. Come on, it's a fun place. Come on, are you guys having a good time? It's a fun place. Thank you. Please, and come back. So, um, but in the end, when you look at the history of Puerto Rico, you know, let's start with the Spanish-American War. You know, the Americans kind of show up like at the end to be like, okay, you know, do you remember, do you remember theory? Do you remember manifest, you know, the late 19th century, early 20th century in the United States? Uh, we were into like imperial build, you know, we we're imperialism. You know, it was, you know, it was like, that was the thing. Theodore Roosevelt, look it up. And, and so Cuba and Puerto Rico were, you know, they say they're the, the two wings of the same bird, right? So we've had similar histories in a lot of ways, but we've diverged from it. Um, but this whole issue of, you know, our agriculture being decimated, you, you know, U.S. sugar barons, then, then we get into sort of this relationship where we become laborer. And then, you know, there's a lot of, 
neoliberal policies that actually made Puerto Rico really well. It sort of became sort of this counter to what was happening in 1959. So what happened in Puerto Rico and what you see in Puerto Rico is you start seeing sort of a reactionary to it in, in the context of the Cold War, right? So the model of Puerto Rico be, be not becoming Cuba was actually a strategy of the United States. And then what you have, as in with any colonial society, you have an elite political class that wants to just, that wants to cooperate, right? That, that, that has benefited from this. You know, I grew up in a time in Puerto Rico when, when times were good. You know, when people talk about the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, you know, services, you know, it was like good time Charlie. But what's happened is that you, the spending of this country, like, there's been a lot of money to maintain that. And a lot of the political class, I, you know, words like corruption, or I think I'm underselling it, um, that we've allowed this political class to be reactionary in all this, right? So Puerto Rico is a very conservative island in a lot of ways. So anything that begins to look at right now with poverty and unemployment, it's just not happening. What you're seeing is sort of this backlash. There's this fear in this society uh, dominated by, a, you know, mostly a right wing, I'd say moderate Democrat wing, uh, you know, try to put it in a U.S. context, that we will be the next Venezuela or Cuba if we decide to never become a state of the United States. When in fact, we have no power right now. Puerto Rico has no political power. At all. I, I, I challenge, I mean, al final cabo, we do not have political power. Right. We, you know, people are like, oh, the, the Florida, you know, Florida, Puerto Ricans in Florida elected. Yeah, that, we, we don't even have political power there yet. And so people need to understand, it's like, we have a non-voting member of, of Congress. We have, you know, a, a gubernatorial system that the guy has no, he has no power. We're run by a fiscal control board. And the head of the fiscal control board, I don't know if you guys know this, it was Natalie Jurasko, who used to do her debt things in the Ukraine, I think makes $680,000 right now. So let's talk about La Junta. <laughs> let's talk about La Junta. <laughs> so, the, so the fiscal control board is the fiscal oversight management board, yeah. and it has full financial control of pub public and including higher ed finances yep. here in Puerto Rico. And it was appointed by the U.S. Congress in 2016. So that's what he means when when, uh, when he says. And when, here's when the he thing: says, um, it, it it was formed. The legislation is called Promesa. And yes, Puerto Rico was. I mean, Puerto Rico was not paying its. There was no money, and it was both. It was all the political parties here who spent for 20, 30 years, and sacabó la fiesta. El guiso ya There was nothing, right? It was over. The party was over. But, you know, last time I checked, Wall Street's not the most compassionate place in the world. And can I just add this one comment sure. before? You have to remember one thing about history. How many people know about the insular cases? Um, it's a Supreme Court ruling around the turn of the century. 1901. 1901, 1901 right? Thank you. That's why I have high red people here. Um, <laughs> Read it if you haven't read it. It is perhaps the most racist ruling in the modern 20th century of the United States. I, there's talk about the way we are viewed. The United States views us as, as property, as racially and ethically inferior. And it's all because of the time where, you know, the big Anglo-Saxon superiority of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a blatant racist. Um, that was the time. So you have the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a ruling, and it's still in the books. No one has overturned that. Right. So you have to look at Puerto Rico in the context of the insular cases, because when Puerto Rico runs out of money, and then they're like, Promesa comes, it happened in Obama's last year. Do you ever recall a, bi a bipartisan legislation that got passed in the last year of a lame duck presidency? I'm waiting for the answer. Promesa. 
So PROMESA then creates an unelected board of political appointees. There's seven members. Um, at the time, four were picked by de Democrats because Obama was president. Three were picked by Republicans. Then when Trump becomes president, that switches. And let me just say something. A couple people on that board, they don't like us. They, they look at us through the, through the eyes of the insular cases, that this is our problem, that we're the, we're the natives that couldn't get our, our act together, that we're the ones running around like living off welfare. We're the children. We're the children, right? And they talk a good game here, and the media gives them the thing, and they don't want to, they never want to take my questions. I'm, I'm proudly blocked by three members of the, the, the junta. Like, I want all seven members to block me on Twitter. But I'm at three. <laughs> Getting there. They don't take challenges. You know, they say they're approachable. They say they're for Puerto Rico. They, they, they try to do PR. Um, if you think the political class in Puerto Rico is not that popular, um, La Junta is, if there's anything that probably unites Puerto Ricans, it's, mm -hmm. it's a distaste for, I mean, there's a, I think it's like maybe 10% of the country right now, the island colony, like thinks they're doing a good job. Um, there is this still, but there is this still feeling that this is where I think the colonial thing comes. There's plenty of Puerto Ricans who think we're children as well, because we got to like <clears throat> side with the boss. And, but that's colonialism. Let the Americans come in and- Exactly. Them. Like, it happened in India with the British Empire. It's happening here. And when you, when you talk about it, and, and I feel like that's the truth. And there's a lot of Puerto Ricans who feel that way. But then you get painted because we're so polarized as a society that we cannot have a conversation. Like, if you think we're divided in the United States, come down here, man. It's like, I get afraid. I, I, I personally, I'm, I'm glad this is a private event. Because I'm like, I don't want to deal with like the jerks that come around and like threaten me. But at the same time, I want to, we got to continue to educate about Puerto Rico because it's still, it's too easy to say they're Americans like us. We're not, we're just not. And, and, and I just hope more and more people understand that. And, and, and actually we seek allies in, in this and not necessarily, um, Feel, treat us like children because, especially in higher ed, the UP, the UPR system is being decimated every day. There are students striking right now on the campus in Rio Piedras. I know you guys got a, a pamphlet, a flyer. I think the best thing from a higher education standpoint that, that, that if you are interested is to raise awareness of what's happening at the UP. Because I'm going to ask each and every one of you, imagine if there was a fiscal control board in your state saying, you know what? We're going to raise tuition 300%. And we're going to cut teachers. And we're going to do this. And, and we're going to change your entire system because you've, you've spent too much. And if, if the tables were turned, if that was happening in the United States, people would be up in arms. Well, and it never would because of the 10th Amendment which separates state and federal powers and leaves education as yeah. a state's right. But, um, it, right. Yeah. And that, but we don't, in here in Puerto Rico, that right doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And, and, and so I think if you really want to say that we're Americans like you or us, I would think the best thing that you could do is to raise awareness in the higher education space for the University of Puerto Rico because I have been covering that issue since 2010. I've talked to students, I've talked to professors, I've talked to government officials, and it's the same problem. And it's not getting solved. And it's, and it's too easy. This is what I mean. It's too easy to attack higher ed in this context. That's what's happening here. It's like, oh, here are these, here are these communist kids. You know, it's like they just want an education that's affordable. Is that too much to ask for? Los when, pelu. The, come on. Los, los pelu. They call them like the hairy ones. The, like, right, yeah. exactly. So anyway. Um, yeah, and just to, a real, you know, to point out like the, the Supreme Court that, and I mentioned this yesterday in a session, like the Supreme Court that decided on the insular cases, cases is the same Supreme Court that decided on Plessy v. Ferguson. Exactly. So there's a lot of connections there, except Plessy v. Ferguson got overturned. That's what I'm saying. Plessy v. Ferguson got rejected, and the yeah. insular cases are still in the books. And 
any American that believes in equality and non-discrimination and, you know, every American's the same needs to demand that those insular cases get overturned. I mean, I'm ready. If there's a lot, like, I'm ready. Like, there's, I know people are trying to do it, but I think it's, if the insular cases could get overturned, then the conversation changes. But I don't think it will, because in the end, it, it, it reveals exactly what the United States thinks of us. Right. And so when we, so when, so when we get into the statehood debate, which is, which I, admi I actually admire, I, I have a lot of, you know, people think that I'm, I'm for one thing or another. No, I'm a journalist that looks at Puerto Rican society. I think one of the biggest mistakes that the statehood movement is doing is that it's not shaming the United States enough. And if you're going to, as opposed to like, oh, please give us statehood because, you know, we, we fought in wars and this, when in fact it's like, no, you should, we demand this because you've treated us like second class citizens forever. And you look at us through a racial lens and you think that we're like racially inferior and shame on you. This is just as much as a three fifth compromise. I'm not compare, I'm not equating it, but it's the same type of mentality. This is what white supremacy does. And in the sense, it's like the fact that the statehood movement does not see that. And I've talked to a lot of young statehooders who say like, yes, we have to, we have to embarrass the United, we have to demand this. This is a social and racial justice issue. But, but when you have a political class in the United, and here in Puerto Rico, that's affluent, that's white. You know, the reason I can talk about it is like, I hang out with these people. I grew up with these people in San Juan. There's a reason why San Juan is so affluent. There is, you know, you see it, right? You go out to other parts of Puerto Rico, there's a massive inequality on this island colony. And, and in the end, it's like, whiter Puerto Ricans have the power. And there's still this feeling of like, I gotta do, I gotta impress the master. Yeah. And I know that sounds really like, yeah. like hard to hear sometimes, but when you have that been happening and it's mm -hmm. never been challenged, that's why I don't think, that's why I think there's no movement in statehood because they're not framing it through the right lens. And so, right now the, the political party that's in power is the pro-statehood power. The, right, which, which I, last time I checked has never really had a black Puerto Rican in any position of power and, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of issues. Yeah, anyway. there's a lot there. <laughs> um, so the, so, Status is very important here. The political parties are built around um, status on the island. There's three part, there are more than three parties, but generally, loosely speaking, the parties are built around, you know, status. Um, so the Self-Determination Act, which you've written quite a bit yeah. about, um, yeah. was introduced in March of 2021 by Representative Nidia Velázquez of New York. And it's legislation that declares that Puerto Rico has the authority to call a status convention to vote on its status and that Congress may ratify the decision. Um, it, it was, it, right now it's in committee. It's actually in the Natural Resources Committee, yeah. which is, I think, an interesting- And so is a statehood bill. There are two bills. Okay. There's a statehood bill and a self-determination okay. bill. Yeah. And so, so tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this self-determination. You know, I, it's, it's just so confusing. So I, I come from the place where I make the argument as a Puerto Rican, you know, there's people like, oh, you can't talk about status. It's like status is what has defined us for, for, for decades. We have built a political system on, ter you know, territorial options. <laughs> and, and you can't really talk about Puerto Rico without talking about the status machine. And so one of the things about the bill, about the self-determination bill, it, is that it's a little bit confusing. And it's too easy to be in that self-determination camp and never engage the statehood camp. And I would argue, and maybe, you know, I wish more Puerto Ricans saw this, is that in the end, Congress literally owns us. Okay, if you look at the language, I don't know if it's the answer case, it's another one, but Puerto Rico is not 
up, it's like Puerto Rico is not part of the United States. It belongs to the United States. That alone should unite Puerto Ricans on this island colony. That alone, that we are a property. We need to figure out first our own, our own like understanding of what it is to decolonize our minds. Because when you live in a place when you've been so dependent, and let's not forget, you know, the Spaniards did their work, you know, 450 years before the Americans showed up. So like, I mean, we're talking about, you know, an island that's never seen any destiny, maybe for a little, you know, maybe we were autonomous for like less than a year. It's like, ooh, and then, then, then the Americans invaded. So it was like, oh, party's over, that was nice. But I, I, I try to, I don't necessarily think that Congress cares about what Puerto Rico, they don't care. I, I don't think, they're like, if you, if you pulled, it's like, yeah, sure, be a state or whatever, whatever. They don't mm -hmm. care, right? So then is what I say to the point. It's like, so what are you going to do about it? Because what's happened, I mean, I'm 52, okay? And, you know, if you look at, you know, when you go to the airport, Luis, Luis Munoz Marin was sort of like, you know, he's complicated, but I got to get, you know, but he was the one that led Puerto Rico into sort of this modern industrialized place mm -hmm. with a big price. You know, there's a lot, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that left the island in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s to by go design. To, by design to go to places like there's a, people go like, oh, why is Holyoke, Massachusetts? Why are there so many Puerto Ricans in Holyoke, Massachusetts? It's like it was a mill town and you needed cheap labor. And, you know, it's the reason why West Side Story was so popular in the 50s, you know, in the early 60s, because we were the cheap labor. You know, that was our turn. In Ohio. Ohio, you know, you go to Hawaii. places like New Jersey, Ohio, Connecticut. This is why I was like, why are so many Puerto Ricans in Connecticut or in, in, in Massachusetts? It's like, so they've been there. But the point being to get, it's like, so when Munoz sort of was defeated by Ferre, who was the pro-statehood Republican, it, it was in 1968, it literally has created this push and pull for more than 50 years. And I say to myself, ¿Qué ha pasado? What's happened? Nothing has happened. Nothing. Nothing. I, I, like, nada, nada, nothing. So I'm saying to myself, why do we keep doing this to ourselves? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's where I feel like if we don't come to terms with understanding that we are all living under a colony here and, and we have to put the status options aside and we have to realize that we have more in common together. Um, but that's not going to happen overnight because the political class of Puerto Rico has done more to destroy this island colony than the United States government. Okay. And, and, and I say that, you know, when you see, an elected governor forced to resign. Oh, I know where you're going. Ricardo Rosselló in 2019. <laughs> and where you see close to a million people on the most, you know, the most traveled, like the iconic highway of Puerto Rico where you come out of San Juan, Avenida Las Americas, you know, Expreso Las Americas. And that just happened, where are we in 2020? That just happened two years ago? Yeah. And he's back. He's back like pretending that he's advocating for statehood as an elected official of a shadow member of Congress. I mean, it's, I'm sorry, I get too granular here, but there are now shadow members of Congress who are elected by the people of Puerto Rico to advocate for statehood in DC. And they literally are in a, <laughs> in a we work room in like Vienna, Virginia. And then they'll go, to the, they'll go to the White House with their little placards and put it on social media. And then people down here are like, oh wow, we're in front of the White House. Nobody cares. Memo. And I think, and I think part of the argument- Nobody is, cares yeah. up there. Like here it's like, this is the, the yeah. this is El Centro. Yeah. And I say, hi, I love y'all, nobody cares. Like, 
Right, and part of the we reason don't love you. is that it's the it's a island or archipelago, however you with uh which is with a high poverty rate. It's a poorer than the poorest state. Labor participation for it was at forty. Like it's one of the highest in the country. Like the labor like, unemployment is ridiculous. And they'll suspect they'll suspect they Republicans suspect that it will be a democratic state. And so the idea that this would ever pass anything in Congress is... Well, the other thing you know, that we haven't even touched upon, because of this sort of lack, these two parties sort of messing up, you know, the pro, the status quo Commonwealth Party, which has its own issues, because you're literally defending colonialism. And anyone that's like, this current, this current system is great. I'm like, there's enough facts to say it's not so great, right? Um, but what's happened is that you now have the rise, legit rise, of third parties like uh, NBC um, and Dignidad, Proyecto uh, Dignidad, which is a right-wing evangelical party in the United, in, here in Puerto Rico. And I'm telling you, there's like six, you think the Texas abortion bill that you heard and things like that, and, and it's happening here right now in a lot of ways, and it's growing. And you're seeing the, the major political parties lose massive support and just people being disconnected from, from politics in general. So when you have young people here who actually still, this is the part about you. I mean, remember when we were all young? It's like, everything's so optimistic. You're like, I'm gonna change the world. Um, there is still this, this feeling on campuses here in Puerto Rico that they can change the world. And they want to participate politically. They want to change. They want to stay. You know, I, my generation left. I'm Generation X. You know, we left Puerto Rico. We, you know, I, I but it's home. I mean, I, I tweeted that I'm coming home home. You know, I'm home is Boston right now, but this is home home. Um, there's this feeling, and, and what's, what's the problem with the top political parties? They don't, they've completely been disconnected. So there's such a major disconnect. There's a lack of accountability. You have a fiscal control board that gets to do whatever they want. They don't like that when you say, like, no, we have the best interests of Puerto Ricans. I'm like, you know what? I've had calls with friends of mine who are bondholders, who I went to school with, who call me up, who work in Wall Street and be like, what's up with these Puerto Ricans? I'm like, why don't you, why don't you cancel the debt? You know what? You made a bad, you know, you made a bad gamble. Sorry, like it was a mistake. The best thing to do is cancel the debt or do something or audit it or do something or give us a friggin' break. But you're literally, you're literally decimating Puerto Rico so you can make money. And then we haven't even talked about uh, Law 2022. I don't know if you guys have heard that. It's like Law 2022, basically, if you're, if you're a person of means if you're, or you're like ultra rich, you don't have to pay taxes here, so you can move here. So you have these multi-billionaires like buying property and buying beaches, beachfront, excuse me, <clears throat> right now, and and living here. And like, how colonial is that? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what's you know In what I mean? In the midst of In the midst of all this, and it's like, well, Puerto Rico, I don't have to pay taxes. So I'm going to move down and make all my money. You know, Logan Paul is a perfect example, the YouTuber. Um, who has moved down to Puerto Rico. So he doesn't have, and he has this video of like, you don't have to pay taxes anymore. So it's this neoliberal dream that we've created here. And the people that are suffering the most are, are, you know, are the young and the elderly and the unemployed and the poor. Right. And, and, you know. And part of the student's argument is like, we are, you're increasing tuition on us to pay for a debt that we did not create. Right. Right. The political, the people who should be paying for the debt is the political class of Puerto Rico. They they should all be taxed because they're the ones that created the problem. So you mentioned a few times, sort of like the entrenchment of politics in like in everything here. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a casual observer, um, it seems to me that um, people are really careful here, both in higher ed as well as in journalism, when it comes to talking out against, speaking out against the government. Um, you know, I think with students being a huge exception, um, they've been in, in the streets and faculty, some faculty. Um, 
and I know that you're quite outspoken. Um, so tell <laughs> no, me a I'm very bit, quiet. So tell me a little bit about like, how do you see the, in, the intertwinement of like higher ed and politics here on, in, in Puerto Rico? You know, I, I do feel like the vision of, of having an, you know, having this sort of educated bilingual population that's ready to like crush it. <laughs> I don't know, like that vision of, of higher ed as a, as, a, as a right and not a privilege, like has a lot of merit. You know, I think when you look back at the, the 30s and the 40s in Puerto Rico, um, it was during the time of FDR, the New Deal, right? And a lot of things that couldn't be happening in the United States were happening down here. And Puerto Rico became a model of this. But I think what got lost in the translation, we've, we, lost our, we lost our compass, like we lost our direction. I think the inequality has always been there, you know? And it's just been sort of like seeping and seeping and seeping. And now what you have in Puerto Rico is, I mean, if you're making good money in Puerto Rico, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. Everything else is like a struggle. And, and then you can't, you can't have, you cannot talk about modern day Puerto Rico in any context without bringing Hurricane Maria. We haven't even brought that up. That devastation and what happened after has literally sent a jolt into what Puerto Ricans want to do moving forward. So we're kind of in this messy phase now where you have the status quo still fighting for its interest. You have this fiscal control board. You have a populace that's some of it's disengaged and tuned out. And some of them are like, we got to change this. And we're starting to just question it all. Then you add, um, <laughs> then you add, you know, then you add a pandemic where that was, you know, it, it impacted this place in a lot of ways, very negatively. Um, it was tough. So I'm from the South. Uh, my family's from the South. So I will also add into that the earthquakes. So, oh yeah, the earthquakes. So when, when you know, here, or at least I should say here, in the U.S., we talk about learning loss because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. In southern Puerto Rico, that year you also had earthquakes. So you had students not going to school because yeah. of the pandemic. Before that, it was because of the earthquakes because the school structures were not sound based on like the design, yeah, this popularized design for schools, and a school actually collapsing, which meant that a lot of parents did not want to send their children to school. And before that, you had Hurricane Maria. So now we're talking about years yeah, and, and, of students not and going to school. And so when you're a you know, when you don't yeah. have the way to self-sustain yourself, when you're a colony, I keep using that word, and I think we have to continue to use that. And I and I really hope that when you go back and ask, talk to your communities, that it's okay to 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 say that colonialism is alive and well in the United States like in 2021, and this is why. It's, we're always in a deficiency. So if you, if you take the deficiencies of any inequality in the United States, multiply it yeah. in Puerto Rico. And it's, and like I said, it goes back to what I said, it's just too easy to let, and as Americans who want to participate in this messy experiment we call the United States, the best thing you can do for Puerto Ricans is to say they're not Americans like us and we've mistreated them for more than 120 plus years and we got to figure it out and we have to come to terms with our own history and our own ugliness that how we've treated this island colony. It's on us as Americans. We don't have those conversations because those conversations are incredibly uncomfortable 
And I would argue that they're just as important as the conversations we're having in this quote unquote post-racial transformation. Because last time I checked, right, racism got solved, right? Like in the last two years, of course not. I mean, what we're seeing is a backlash, right? We're seeing it every day and you guys are, I see it, I mean, I feel it. Um, but I would just love for Puerto Rico to start being considered on the same level of some of the bigger issues that we're trying to tackle as Americans. Because if you treat us like a colony and you think of us as a colony, when it's time to address us, you're still, you're not elevating us. We're still a colony. And I just want to amplify and elevate the urgency of, of anything, of resolution, something. This marriage hasn't worked. Like, yeah. you're even, not into us. Even the UN has tried to intervene. Yeah, it's bad. like, you know, it's like, it's like we're in a really, yeah. we're in a really bad relationship. And it's, and Puerto Rico is the, the, the survivor, the domestic abuse survivor so, so in a lot of ways. And what do you do? It's like in an unhealthy relationship, it's like, oh, maybe if I do this, they'll like me more. Yeah. It's like, no, I don't, I don't like you. It's like, no. and I'm not saying, and here's the thing. I'm not advocating for any political status in this conversation. I'm just advocating for actual movement and resolution. And if we decide to become a state and respect and respect, if, if Puerto Rico, if, if, con you know, because Congress gets to decide, we don't get to decide, you know, Congress, if, if we become a state, then we become a state. If we become a freely associated, whatever, I don't even know what that is, then fine. If we become independent, then give us reparations. Well, that was my next you question. Know, it's like, <laughs> and give us reparations for statehood too. Yeah. Because here's the other thing. I say it all the time. It's like, yeah, make us a state, but um, here's your bill since 1898. Mm -hmm. Please pay. So, so that actually was my next question in the next 30 seconds. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about reparations and how you, is that a possibility? I think any conversation about Puerto Rico and status, if it doesn't involve reparations, it's not a real conversation. It's not a real conversation. And I, and I, and I urge the governor of Puerto Rico right now, if he's a legit statehooder, who understands history, who understands that the insular cases, you need to start demanding and respecting and, and saying, you know, we're Puerto Ricans here and this is what we want. Not, oh, pobrecito, America, sabe, somos estado, but, you know, we fought in wars and everything. No, if you want it, grab it. And if you're not having questions about reparation, reparations, you're not, and if you're not connecting our past and how we've looked at this, if we're not making this status issue a social and racial justice issue, then Puerto Rico will never, never advance at all, at all. So okay. I say yes, hard yes to reparations. Okay. Um, and this is my Dice is the Mayor moment. Um, okay. How were you born in the Bronx, but you're a Red Sox fan? <laughs> I think this requires some explanation. Uh, just Google the Bronx Judas on Twitter, on, on Google. It explains everything. I'm going to tell you very, I, I went to Boston. I went to school up in, in the Boston area um, as a Yankees fan. But then people like Nomar Garcia Parra and Pedro Martinez and David Ortiz started okay. showing up in my life in the late 90s. And these, you know, these, I mean, Pedro Martinez, like this cool <laughs> black Dominican man. And now it's, I'm sorry, Alex Cora. I mean, Fair come enough. on, the Caguas, he's from Caguas, from my hometown. You know, there's Puerto, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I've turned over. But if you really wanted the story, Google the Bronx Judas. There's a great piece in NPR about it, and it explains a lot more than I just did. So I just plugged my, my interview. So anyway. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much, Julio. Oh, thank you. You're brilliant. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Do we walk up? Please welcome to the stage, Ash 2021 Program Committee Co-Chair, Dr. Natasha Kroon. Stay right there. All right, so on behalf of the 2021 Ash Conference Planning Committee, our team, the Ash membership, um, I want to say thank you 
for this, for allowing us to listen, to learn some new things, to unlearn some things. I certainly took a lot of notes. Um, and I'm always thinking, as I'm, I know many folks in here are thinking about history and the importance of understanding our history, particularly if we're attempting to deconstruct and reconstruct and build things, right? Knowing how we got there so we know what to yeah. actually do in the yeah. future. Um, thinking about the ways that we can reconceptualize the conversation about what Puerto Rico is in terms of this island colony perspective. Um, so many great gems, and I really appreciate, I personally appreciate it, and I think everyone who's And then I know listen. there's academics that are from Puerto Rico that's local. Please listen to those voices yes. as well. They are amazing. There's amazing work that's being yes. done. Bring them up, bring them to your colleges, yes. because they're awesome. Yes. Thank you, coalition building, collaborations, and as you called for the allyship. So I want to say on behalf of all of us, a small token of I love our it. appreciation. Um, I hope this makes it- I like it. On the wall, okay, great, it's perfect. It's gonna make it on my wall. This is <laughs> perfect. great, thank, so thank you thank so you. much. Awesome, so I love it. Oh wow, that's my name on it. I love it. Thank you, thank you very much. Listo.